Hello again, everybody. We're going to talk here and start uh, some revamp talks on post-operative fever. You probably know the mnemonic, wind, water, walking, and wound. Um, so we're going to run through each of these. I'm going to try to keep them pretty short, uh, but there are some really important things that you need to know here, um, particularly as we talk about pneumonia, because uh, the treatments are different when we talk about pneumonia that you acquire potentially in the hospital compared to the typical community acquired pneumonia. So you're going to want to pay close attention to that. These are very important. These are very common questions on the USMLE when it comes to uh, the, the surgical questions. So this is, this is super important stuff. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the I button on the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated. All right, so let's just briefly talk about what post-op fever is. Post-op fever means that you have a uh, temperature of over 100.4 for two days or over 102.2 for one day. That's it. It occurs in about 13 to 14% of patients, so a decent number of patients. You can probably imagine that there are certain risk factors, um, such as being older, being on more opiates, having more major surgery, that are going to raise your risk, and we're going to talk about what some of those risk factors are. The differential is very much dependent on the day on which the fever begins. Now, there, that said, there is a lot of overlap in clinical practice. You've got to rely on your clinical judgment. Uh, so don't just go, well, if it's day four, it can't be pneumonia. Or if it's day three, it can't be a wound infection. Look at the wound. Listen to the lungs. Ask the patient, does it hurt to pee? All of that stuff, because there is overlap. And what I want to show you is this very nice diagram. Oh, sorry, that's not, not yet. Okay, so we'll come back to this. So what I want to show you here is, let's take pneumonia, for instance, since that's the topic here. You can see here is like your baseline risk, right? And you can see it peaks at day two, but you're not really back to baseline until about day 13. So yes, you can get a pneumonia on day seven for sure. So if you're looking at this, this is most common and when you're at highest risk, uh, but it's not perfect. So on an exam, I would expect for each of these to be within this range, but in practice, you can't just say, well, it's day four, we can rule out pneumonia. No, you can't do that. Okay, so we're gonna talk about atelectasis and pneumonia here. Let's start with a vignette. On your morning rounds, you visit your patient, a 52-year-old guy who is on post-op day two for an open coli. He is alert and in no apparent distress and has no complaints. He, te he tells you that he's mostly been sleeping since the surgery. He slept well overnight and has no problems at this time. Blood pressure 130 over 80, heart rate 102, respiration 19, temperature 100.9. Physical exam is significant for a four centimeter surgical incision over the right upper quadrant, which is clean and well-dressed. Rails and wheezes are heard in the left lower lung field. He, his pain is controlled on Dilaudid PCA, which he uses as frequently as possible. What is the most likely diagnosis here? All right, so I highlighted the things here that you want to pay attention to. So this guy is a little bit older, middle age. Uh, he's on post-op day two, so we're thinking of wind. Uh, he had a cholecystectomy, uh, so this was an open cholecystectomy, so a slightly more significant surgery than if it were laparoscopic. Now, here's the important stuff. He's been mostly sleeping, and he's using his Dilaudid frequently, so that's going to reduce his respiratory drive. You don't breathe as deeply while you're sleeping, and certainly not when you're on opioids. Uh, his heart rate is a little elevated, his temperature is a little elevated, so he does have indeed a post-op fever. Uh, I did say if it's over 100.4, you have to have it for two days. That's technical, but they may not tell you that on the exam. So know that for clinical practice, but on the exam, if they're telling you a patient post-op has a fever, just assume it's a post-op fever. Um, you also hear some adventitious lung sounds. Another thing, though, uh, it, rather than having adventitious lung sounds, you may hear diminished lung sounds, too. So that's another possibility. Um, so the most likely diagnosis here is post-op atelectasis, but it could be pneumonia. And so we will need to do some differentiating. 
Now, anaphylaxis is just a collapse of the alveoli. It is not an infection. Why it causes a fever, I don't know. It doesn't always cause a fever, but it can. There is an increased incidence of atelectasis among surgical patients because they are typically not breathing as deeply, particularly if they had cardiothoracic surgery. A lot of these patients are in opiates, and so that's going to reduce their respiratory drive. Uh, the most probable cause of post-op fever in that one to two day period is indeed atelectasis, but like I said, you might not have a fever, you might not catch it. Um, and that's not really a big deal if you don't catch it because there's really no sequelae of this. It does raise your risk of pneumonia. That you will catch. Uh, so the symptoms, fever sometimes, maybe some tachypnea, maybe tachycardia, but not a very dramatic presentation. On auscultation, you may hear decreased breath sounds. You may hear adventitious lung sounds. Uh, there may be dullness to percussion over the affected areas, but it's very difficult to tease out. So if you've got a patient who's got a fever in the first couple days, get a CBC and get a chest x-ray, pulse ox too, uh, but CBC and chest x-ray. Now a CBC is going to help you differentiate this from pneumonia because if indeed you do have an infection, your white count is gonna go up. If you don't have a high white count, uh, no signs of infection, you're probably dealing with atelectasis, you don't need to treat. Chest x-ray will be good. We'll look at some appearances of the chest x-ray. It can be anything from unremarkable to visible collapse of an entire lung. So here is atelectasis. So what you see here, this is not consolidation. This is collapsed lung here. Not the whole lung, uh, but part of the lung. A lobe, perhaps, is collapsed. And so that causes that that opaque appearance. Um, unlike with pneumonia, which looks very similar on chest x-ray, but that's actually due to, to lobar consolidation rather than due to collapse, but they look very similar. Okay, so here you see it again and again. And here you can see an entire collapse. Now one hint, and you might not always see this, but you will see it if you've got a lot of collapse, is that you can see some tracheal and mediastinal deviation. And the reason for that, unlike with a pneumonia where, where the opacity is due to consolidation, what you have with atelectasis is a collapse. So there's gonna be more room and that's going to push or rather pull uh, the, the trachea and the mediastinum uh, towards that side. So that could be a hint, but you don't always see it. So by itself, atelectasis is not harmful, but it does raise your risk of pneumonia. It can be a precursor. Uh, respiratory complications are the most common single cause of morbidity after a surgical procedure. Post-op pneumonia is the major differential. CBC is really going to help you. The treatment for post-op atelectasis is get the patient breathing. Get them up walking. Try to reduce their dosage of pain medication. Switch them from opiates to NSAIDs. Anything you can do to increase that respiratory drive and increase their ventilation is going to help. So incentive spirometry can be useful. Call a respiratory therapist. And they can always come in and help you out. Uh, but be very vigilant for pneumonia. If that fever is persisting for more than a couple days, you need to repeat the chest x-ray, repeat the CBC, look at the neutrophil count. If you start thinking of pneumonia, then you need to treat, send off sputum cultures, um, and treat them empirically. Uh, so incentive spirometry, great thing. Every patient should have an incentive spirometer and be encouraged to use it. There's really no harm that can come from that. Now, pneumonia is an infection. It's often a complication of atelectasis. It has been described as the most common post-op complication, but there's conflicting uh, data there. Uh, correct impl implementation of post-op care, like an incentive spirometer, getting up, moving around, reducing the opiate dose as much as possible of not getting rid of it, uh, will really help reduce the risk here. Symptoms will be dependent on severity, but the big thing is productive cough. You don't see that in atelectasis because there's no infection going on. There's no inflammation, so they're not going to have a productive cough. They'll have maybe a dry cough, but often they don't even have a cough. Um, so look for that productive cough persisting more than a couple days, and then all those adventitious lung sounds, of course, you can see as well. So our workup is pretty much the same. You get a chest x-ray, CBC, sputum culture. Sputum cultures aren't going to help you. They are the most accurate test, but it's not going to help you because it takes too long for it to come back. Uh, mostly we use those, those sputum cultures to check sensitivity so we can adjust the antibiotic if needed. Um, so 
what you'll see on the chest x-ray is a low bar consolidation. Most of the time, CBC, you'll see the high white count. If they are in severe respiratory distress, you need to be ready to intubate. Make sure and get ABGs. Any patient who's in severe respiratory distress, you need to get ABGs. Um, you work them up for ARDS, and what we do is uh, take the ratio of the FiO2 to the PaO2, which you can only get from the ABG. If it's less than 200, um, it shows that they're not uh, ventilating properly, not perfusing properly. Um, then in that case, uh, you may be working with an ARDS. That patient needs to be sent off to the ICU. Post-op pneumonia is typically hospital acquired, and so we need to treat it as such. So here's a consolidation from pneumonia. Sometimes it can be really hard to see. Remember, always get AP and lateral views when you're ordering a chest x-ray for pneumonia. Now, diagnosis of hospital-acquired pneumonia requires a positive image, plus a couple more things. Of course, fever. This is on post-op fever, so we assume we're we've got a fever. Get that CBC. You'll see a leukocytosis. At that point, you've got your... your uh, your diagnosis, but a purulent secretion can be another uh, criterion to help you as well. Most people will have all of these. Um, so Pseudomonas and MRSA are the big things that we worry about when somebody acquires pneumonia in the hospital versus out in the general community. Uh, we treat this a little bit different. So you're not going to be giving azithromycin PO and sending them off. You're not going to be doing azithromycin and ceftriaxone or doxycycline and uh, treating them like you would treat an ordinary community-acquired pneumonia. What you're going to be doing here is you are going to be covering for a possible pseudomonas. And so you can do either one drug or you can do three. And what that depends on is their risk factors. Um, so I would always go with at least one pseudomonal drug, anti-pseudomonal drug, and that one would be cefepime. That's the one that I would go with. Uh, Piperacillin tazobactam or zosin is another good one, um, but I would go with one of those two. Now, if they have risk factors for a resistant gram-negative pathogen or risk factors for MRSA, so maybe they were previously an on antibiotics, they're recently hospitalized, they came from a nursing home, they've had MRSA in the past, uh, then you need to cover two pseudomonas drugs and one MRSA drug. So you would go, okay, I should probably bring you up here. Um, so what you would do then is you would, you would go with the Zosin or the Cefepime, and then you go with another anti-pseudomonal drug, and then you do one for MRSA. You need to know your anti-pseudomonal drugs, and you need to know your anti-MRSA drugs. So vancomycin or linazolid, those are good for MRSA. There's a ton of drugs that are out there for pseudomonas. Piperacillin tazobactam is a good one. That's Zosin. Uh, Cefepime is a good one. Tobramycin is a good one. Amikacin. Um, there's tons of drugs. You just need to know the drugs that cover pseudomonas because they might not always give you on your exam the one that you would normally go with. But I would say Cefepime and Piperacillin tazobactam are the, the most high-yield drugs for pseudomonas, and vancomycin and linazolid are the two most high-yield drugs for MRSA. These are some things that you can do to reduce the risk of a hospital-acquired pneumonia after surgery. So using that incentive spirometry, balancing pain control with respiratory drive. So if they're in too much pain, they're not going to be breathing as deeply because it hurts. If they're on too much, uh, if they're on sedatives like benzos or if they're on uh, opioids, they're not going to breathe as deeply because their respiratory drive is down. So you've got to balance them, and that can be really difficult. Avoid intubation if possible. Uh, try to wean them off from those opioids to an NSAID. Even if it's a prescription NSAID, that's fine. Uh, we want to try to get them off the opioids, though. Oral care, brushing your teeth, that has been shown to reduce the risk of pneumonia. And then elevating the bed, particularly if they are on a ventilator. And that is it.